very, very happy to welcome uh, Professor Louisa Moore and uh, Dr. Nick Siever uh, to uh, have what is the first uh, event of a new centre at the University of Warwick. In the great tradition of uh, centres at Warwick following things like the Cybernetic Cultures Research Unit of the 90s, uh, this centre is too currently housed off campus um, in a deeply uh, middle-class establishment of my garden office uh, in, in the uh, outskirts of, of Coventry, uh, which, which uh, parallels the, uh, the, the cybernetic culture research unit's existence uh, above a body shop in Leamington Spa uh, <laughs> as the basis of their radical activities. Uh, so uh, welcome everybody to the Centre for Digital Inquiry. Uh, this is the first of what I hope will be many uh, interesting and, uh, and uh, engaging events. Uh, so we're here uh, this afternoon, this morning, depending on where you are, um, to talk Cloud Ethics, uh, a recently published um, book um, authored by uh, Professor Amor. Uh, so I will begin with very, very brief introductions uh, to uh, our two discussants, um, and then we'll kick right in. Uh, so if you are here, then you're probably aware of uh, <laughs> Louise's work already. Um, she's a professor of political geography um, based in uh, what looks to be an excellent department uh, at the University of uh, Durham, the geography department that has uh, many, many interesting academics, a few we've been lucky enough to borrow or, or steal from at Warwick. Uh, uh, she's the author of um, a number of books. Uh, the, the first book that I came across uh, was The Politics of Possibility. Uh, it was recommended to me by an old colleague. Um, but I found, Louise, that you're the kind of uh, writer who, uh, who I tend to come across in unexpected places. And I was recently finishing an article with, uh, with a, a colleague, Michael Dieter, and he alerted me uh, in our final revisions that you had published a series of highly uh, pertinent articles about 10 or 15 years before we came across the topic of, uh, this was about digital identity, and we were writing in the context of banking. Uh, and, and so uh, I've had a number of these kind of situations where I've come across things that you've written several years um, earlier than I've uh, become aware of uh, the importance of a, a line of inquiry. Uh, so. Uh, moving to uh, Nick, uh, who's an assistant professor at the University of Tufts uh, in the United States, uh, assistant professor of anthropology. Uh, I first came across uh, Nick's work in a small short piece in the magazine Lim, uh, and this was on recommender systems, uh, uh, a research topic that I believe you've carried forth um, and, and will culminate in, uh, in a highly anticipated monograph, uh, which last time I checked was called Computing Taste, uh, uh, forthcoming uh, on the University of Chicago Press. Um, but I'm sure uh, people joining us today uh, will be aware of many articles that, uh, that Nick has written uh, on the topic of algorithms from a broadly anthropological perspective. Uh, so welcome to our two speakers and uh, take it away, Nick. All right, great. Well, it's nice to see all these familiar names in the, in the sidebar here. Um, I've just prepared like a little bit of comments about what I think is so exciting and interesting about uh, this book and then some questions uh, to get us going. But I think the goal here is, is ultimately to be sort of fielding and discussing questions that come from all these wonderful people we have over here on the side. Um, so with that, let's see here. Okay, there we go. So let's start with the lightning strike. Uh, in her last book, The Politics of Possibility, Louisa Moore quotes a description of sovereign decision-making from Brian Masumi. The sovereign decision is like a flash of lightning. Uh, it happens all of a sudden and must not be explained, lest it become clear that the sovereign was ever in a state of indecision. In this theory, inexplicability and instantaneity are the key attributes of sovereign power. Nobody knows where the lightning comes from. Now in that book, Professor Amor argues that this is a lousy theory for understanding contemporary power. Lightning strikes aren't thrown down capriciously from the heavens, but emerge from administrative settings that are, she writes, teeming with life, technique, 
art, technology, violence, resistance, and potentiality. Now, in her marvelous new book, Cloud Ethics, she traces these themes uh, through the world of machine learning, giving us a way to think about where the lightning comes from. Now, the cloud here, of course, is that globally distributed network of communication, calculation, and collection uh, that's increasingly playing a role in decisions uh, that range from the mortal, like targeting drone strikes, to the venial, uh, like recommending music. Now, Amor writes very cogently about the former, uh, and as an anthropologist of algorithmic recommendation, I've been trying to make sense of the latter. So, we have lots of excellent work that's dedicated to pointing out how the cloud is a mystification, right? The machinery of the cloud sits in places, uh, it's made of materials, uh, it's much more concrete than one might imagine. And Amor calls this uh, work Cloud One uh, uh, in her book. Uh, what she does here that I think is really interesting though is to take the figure of the cloud and to use it uh, to designate the diffuseness of our algorithmic systems, right? Data that's collected in one setting uh, might train a system that makes decisions in another and those decisions and their consequences accumulate and spread uh, in ways that can be hard to trace. Uh, so Amore's cloud is neither the concrete network of data centers that's been mapped by cultural geographers, uh, nor the vague idealized marketing buzzword of the software industry. Rather, it's a kind of analytic. It's a distributed perceptual technology uh, that opens a strange aperture on the social world. So the cloud is not light and airy, uh, but rather weighted with history. Uh, as she writes, uh, all algorithmic decisions contain the residue or sediment of past decisions. That is to say, the models that machine learners learn are sites of profound ethical consequence. Uh, like real storm clouds, the cloud is full of dirt, and it depends on that dirt to condense actual decisions out of the vapors of potentiality. Now, the book is much more committed uh, to the technical specificities of particular machine learning techniques than a lot of work in this area, which is a very welcome development. Um, but there is a general model of whatever the cloud is uh, in play here, and it's based primarily on deep learning. Uh, algorithmic systems take in vast amounts of data, all of which reflects prior decisions, whether by humans deciding what data to collect or by other algorithms making classification choices. Uh, internally, they're essentially doubt processing machines, right? They channel and mold uncertainty and build up a charge until at the last moment, the lightning of decisions strikes out. Uh, that moment of closure of decision is a real central object of critique in the book. Uh, it's where the cloud forecloses on other possibilities, where it collapses all of that precisely quantified uncertainty uh, into a singular decision. So inexplicable and abrupt, this is the algorithmic version of the sovereign strike. And the question is, what should we do about it? Uh, dominant approaches to the ethics of these systems have focused on making them transparent or explainable uh, as though what we need uh, is for clouds to give fuller accounts of themselves to, to tell us why the lightning struck where it did. Um, Amor gives a great critique of this approach, arguing that this is the wrong track and what we need uh, is not more supposed certainty, but rather an ethics that works from doubt uh, and partial knowledge. Now, this is, as a lot of feminist ethicists have argued, a good idea in general, um, but it's particularly a good idea here, uh, where doubt and opacity are endemic uh, to cloud technologies uh, and overstated claims to certainty are one of our major problems. Now, it's not always obvious how we can do this in practice, right? Who could make a cloud ethics happen? Who could perform cloud ethics uh, and where they could do it. Uh, Amor argues that the algorithm, she says uh, beautifully, should carry the weight of its weightings. That is that like the thousands of tuned calculations in something like a neural net should be considered politically consequential, right? The ethics of machine learning should be located not only in how they're used, uh, but in how they're built and how they're trained. Uh, this is great. It's asking us to think critically about details that computer scientists usually prefer to leave automated. And she has a lovely quote in the book from one of them who says, you can't make the weights political, Louise, because they're not really a thing. We don't know how they work. We're just messing around with them. Now, taking this play, this messing around seriously, uh, would be a key part of cloud ethics in practice. It doesn't mean locating responsibility for the lightning strike in any particular author, and there's a great critique of authorship in the book, um, but rather in this complex and diffuse field of electrostatic charge. We can't just reject the existence of diffuse and opaque and heterogeneous decision-making, right? That's just what it is to be a person in a socio-technical world, but we do need new ways of engaging with it. Now, the counterpart move that Amor calls for in the end of the book uh, is a politics of refusal. 
uh, right? Machine learning is predicated on an epistemology of the attribute. It identifies features across populations. Uh, it projects them into the future. Uh, ultimately, uh, she calls for us to reject the logic of attributes and to claim the mantle of the untributable, uh, to sustain an ethical approach to other people that respects their singularity, that knows that they're irreducible to shared attributes, uh, and that insists on an ineradicable gap between ourselves and the attributes that are ascribed to us in the cloud. So there's a lot more to say about this book. Uh, there's a lot going on in here, it's great. Um, but I'll stop there and just ask a couple questions to sort of kick us off. And these sort of come from my own uh, experience uh, as, uh, as an anthropologist working on this topic. So the first question is about what counts as a decision? I described how the decision is a sort of con very consequential uh, uh, theme here in the book. Um, and how should we make sense of decisions that emerge from algorithmic systems? Now, here, if you've read my work and, and uh, Professor Amor's work, it might look like we're at odds. So here's a line that I've uh, published uh, uh, last year, I think. Uh, there's no such thing as an algorithmic decision. There are only ways of seeing decisions as algorithmic. Uh, now, I think we agree more than it sounds like. What I mean by that is that if we attend to the broader scene in which algorithmic decisions happen, there's always someone who could turn the system off, refuse its output, or order that it could be changed. That person may not be the person we want it to be, but somewhere they exist. If they feel like they can't do that, or if they don't do that, then the reasons why, uh, in my mind, are just as consequential to the ethics of this system, to how it works, than anything internal to the system. So the first question is, where do institutions that operate algorithmic systems, uh, you know, like police forces, uh, judges, uh, companies, where do they fit in a cloud ethics? How do we locate them socio-technically? Um, I might just do the second question because it's fast and we can sort of go wherever we feel is appropriate. Um, the second question is about the unattributable. So I felt the force of that critique of not reducing people to their attributes that they share with others, as, as it's in the subtitle of the book, um, as a social scientist, uh, right? Attributes are not only something we see in computation, but in all sorts of work that tries to identify uh, the reality of phenomena uh, beyond the level of the individual. Now, I'm not saying that all social science is ethically desirable work, but I am curious how you see your call for embracing the unattributable and for the radical singularity of people. Uh, how do you see that relating to the project of the social sciences in general uh, or to other political efforts to identify and form uh, new collectivities? So that's what I got to start with and I'm looking forward to talking some more. Thank you so much for your, for your comments, such generous comments. And it's just, I can't express really enough my gratitude for you all in allowing me to kind of not feel that like the book kind of goes into a void, you know, and it's just been so wonderful to hear a response. Um, you know, when something's taken so long to write, it's just really great to kind of hear a response to it. And I'm just so grateful to you for, for that. And particularly for the way that you link that back to the notion of a lightning strike. That's something that has not occurred to me that I'd never thought of actually the relationship between the, the cloud and the lightning. So I'll have to think about that some more. Thank you. But Yes, yeah, so what counts as a decision? And I think that this is something which really does run to the heart of what it was that I'm trying to say here. And I think, you know, that Nick, your own work on, on trying to think through algorithms as culture and not only in culture, you know, is really important there in terms of thinking about uh, what counts as decision. But I guess that what, what I'm really trying to do there is also think about what in the book I call the space of play. So here there's, there's also this kind of sense of actually what do we observe when we observe a group of people playing with a model or trying to reach some kind of judgment about whether a model is or is not ready to go out into the world. And here there's a lot of emphasis on watching the output of the, the model and looking at how that output either you know, closes on the target output. And, and so I, I've always thought that was really fascinating kind of space in that, in a sense, for there to be any decision worthy of the name in Derrida's terms, this would need to advance, as he says, where it could not see. That is, it would have to be a decision made in the dark. It would have to be a decision made uh, aware of the, the kind of, um, that it can never be fully aware of its own consequences, if you like. So I think that my, my kind of approach in the book to thinking about decision was really to try to emphasize, and I, I hope that it comes across, to try to emphasize that the output of the algorithm is never the same thing as a decision, and that actually thinking about what's happening in that space of play between the output of a model and the target output is one potential place um, where we might locate its politics. 
So, and I think part of your question there was really, well, actually, when we think about locating that in decisions made in particular contexts, so in the criminal justice system, or in policing decisions, for example, what's actually happening there. And, you know, it, a, a key part of what I'm trying to do in the book is to try to speak against this notion of the human in the loop, you know, and to say instead, well, actually, what do we, what do we mean by the human in the context of these kinds of um, uh, algorithmic um, systems? And so there, I guess I'm, I am making a call for for as you describe this kind of weightiness to kind of reintroduce the full weight of the decision and its full difficulty and this is really gets to the heart of why for me it's the political questions that are important you know what is the full the full weight of the undecidability that needs to be taken and this is for me absolutely crucial in terms of the kind of question of what we do about it thinking about how we uh, give back the kind of full political ethico political weight to what we what are often called algorithmic decisions so i think i think you're right i think there's some there's a kind of closer uh, relationship between my work and your work there than it might originally appear but i don't mean to suggest that the output of the algorithm is something like a decision uh, and i am you know wanting to kind of keep open and prize open this the concept of a kind of aperture which is both closure and opening so that the decision would have to open onto you know those things that could not be calculated that therefore giving space for other alternative futures and pathways that had not been fully envisaged by by the system so that that's where i'm trying to 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 work in terms of the decision now the attributes the attribute that's so interesting um, the, the question really about am I refusing the attribute and I think I want to say that I'm not refusing the attribute so much as refusing a particular notion of the attribute that is about the qualities the qualities or the propensity so let's let's think about that in a specific kind of um, example and think through how in a context like Cambridge Analytica's clustering of particular data to think about well how do you look for those clusters who are most amenable to being persuaded with particular sorts of targeted media and i think that you know that, that for me there the the attribute is about attributing to the cluster right so that the the next time that is actualized in the body of an individual this is this has a direct relation back to a set of attributes that were unknown or unknowable to that person so in that sense i guess i do refuse the attribute but in another sense i'm embracing it which is to think about how the attribute might be understood as something that's much more closely related to ideas about potentiality so how can we think about the possibilities for new forms of being together what might it mean for us to acknowledge some form of responsibility and in the book i give a few examples of what that responsibility might look like you know how might the the past extracted features of my data in a given city at a particular protest mean that those things are instantiated in the body of a future person unknown to me and i think that is actually not necessarily a refusal and of course you know i um, written the past on, on resistance and notions of refusal in which I say that that really all moments of resistance are of course always moments also of power right so that that means we don't find an outside to the attribute it means that we think carefully about what it means to have something like a society of attributes and we say that the moments of resistance and the moments of possible um, countering or the moments of potential overturning of those logics potentially also come from within this notion of, of attribute. You know, you, uh, part of the commitment I make in the book to reading some very, very old texts on deconstruction, going back to my old 1992 copy of Simon Critchley's book on the ethics of deconstruction, are that, you know, of course the unattributable and the attribute are intrinsically tied together and that these things we need to understand as um, absolutely uh, part of, of forming the text of the thing that we're working with. So thank you, you've given me so much, so much to think about. Did you have a follow-up, Nick? Or, sure. Uh, yeah. 
we can, I can follow up and then we can do whatever if you want to, I, maybe we should encourage people. There is this Q and A feature in, in Zoom where people can can pop questions at, at will and we can pull them out of there. And we can um, see I, them and decide if we want to answer them or exactly. not. Exactly, we can make a decision. Uh, no, I so I thank you, that, that was great. Well, I think one of the things I really loved about the book is the way it sort of thematizes, and I get to talk about this, the aperture, this way that, that sort of machine learning uh, in particular, sort of creates and delimits worlds and sort of spaces of play where people can do things. Um, and I've just been writing about this on this book that may exist eventually about the way that people building these systems are really often in, in uh, imagine themselves be in the service of a kind of open plan of a kind of like, you know, a, mm -hmm. a supportive software something that really makes the future possible in more various ways actually than the present. While their critics obviously say, no, this collapsed things down, a recommender system is gonna give you more of the same stuff forever. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's not how they see it. Now our, our host, Nate, obviously has written some things about the politics of openness. And I think that there are interesting connections across across all of this. But I just wanted to bring up one line, which I really love from the book, um, which I'm sort of reading out of context, but I think is is is, is great. But but in the, the chapter at the end on the unattributable, um, you're writing about machine vision algorithms that sort of attend to images and give give captions for them. Um, and they're doing this sort of scene identification, a scene understanding work. And you write, uh, the algorithms generate the field of meaning. They're the mise-en-scene of the event. They decide what is to be uh, in the single output signal. Understood in this way, there's indeed nothing outside the text in the neural net, uh, which is a lot, I mean, it's a great sort of like deconstructive move, but it's an, it's, it gets at the way that algorithms are environmentalizing, right? That they're making spaces in which people mm -hmm. exist and they have all these politics about environmentalization, about producing the kind of spaces in which we operate. Uh, that can't just be refused, like you're saying, right? Any kind of sort of refusal sort of already within it. Um, but they can, in theory, be tuned in, in sort of different directions. All opennesses are also closures. So I, mm -hmm. I, I thought that was wonderful. Oh, and we do have Q&A. All right. We don't have A, we have Q. I have the chat open. Is that not the right function? Oh, no, Q&A. Okay. Q&A is a separate thing. Uh, while, at the bottom. while you have a look at the Q&A, uh, I'd like to follow up uh, on this question of decision while while the topic has been um, raised. It's something uh, that has has become increasingly central to um, to my own work, uh, which in some ways is the opposite of uh, of looking at algorithms. I'm precisely uh, not looking at algorithmic decisions, but the other decisions that um, are thought to reside kind of um, at the the end point or the threshold of automation. Um, and I, I noticed, um, particularly in the, in the latter half of the book, uh, occasional mentions to bounded rationality. You have the, the discussion um, of, uh, of cybernetics and, and Wiener. Um, I, I wondered uh, whether or not you'd thought or, uh, or considered looking at Herb Simon's uh, work on decision in part because of his role um, with the sciences of the artificial, you know, early AI, mm -hmm. also moving into, um, uh, you know, with his idea of bounded rationality and sat satisficing and so on, it's kind of organizational behavior theory. But in what it's become quite central to the work that I'm doing is his, his kind of uh, presentation of decision making is always already this heavily distributed uh, thing. And uh, w whenever I'm on the topic of, of decision-making, uh, I, I always make reference to this opening passage in a book that he has, where he presents these highly problematic figures like um, a man riding ho horseback, um, an accountant looking over, these are all like 90s, 50s, like kind of male heroic managers, uh, <laughs> uh, an accountant looking over the books, uh, a person in a board meeting, uh, deciding whether or not to say yay or nay. And then it, it's a foil mm -hmm. because this moment of decision-making that you'd attribute to the human uh, for Simon is, is false in that good decision-making always has mm -hmm. these three stages of intelligence, design and choice, which become distributed within an organization um, uh, mm -hmm. always already. Um, and that the, the question of the artificial um, it becomes a kind of a spectrum 
um, of programmability, right? So the more that something can be automated, the more it resides in, in mm -hmm. the possibility for artificial intelligence. And then the more you move up one end, you, you enter um, un you know, uncertainty. And to me, I saw lots of parallels with, you know, with that. Um, uh, and it, it kind of raised this, uh, this question that I had kind of time and time again, which, which is about the, the kind of ontological work that the book does, uh, you know, really always uh, not deconstructing necessarily in, in the literary sense, but questioning the kind of the ontology of the whole actor of the, you know, assumed responsible mm -hmm. person of the discrete algorithm, you know, really kind of um, reaffirming a, a, a distributed um, mode of existence. Uh, and I wondered, like, it, I see it in decision, but I also mm -hmm. see it in these other areas where you're constantly kind of unraveling uh, that. And, and I wonder if you could talk some more about that in relation to the specificity of algorithms, because sometimes it feels like the work is, it does on, ontological work that is true regardless of whether or not we're talking about algorithms, right? If, mm -hmm. if you're talking about the allocation mm -hmm. of responsibility or, or indeed the making of a decision, always mm -hmm. already distributed, always already messy, cloudy, etc. Thank you, Nate. That's, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, I guess just to, to start with where you ended there in terms of that I'm talking about that in relation to algorithms, but why wouldn't we just talk about that in relation to everything else? And I guess that's, that was kind of part of my approach that I've taken in a sense is to say, well, actually, you know, why, why is it actually that these are so often represented to us in the social sciences and the humanities as things that somehow are are of a different order, you know, that here is the black box or here is the opacity. And, you know, I was, I was loving Rua Benjamin's recent, you know, work on, um, on, on race and technology and thinking, yes, you know, there you have another example of it that she's insistent and she's quite right, of course, race itself is also technology. So, you know, what, why is it that we assume that some things are given to us for us to examine and, and other things are not? And so what is it about the algorithm that gives us this very specific kind of ethico-political problematic um, in terms of the actor or in terms of agency and I guess that that is that is a starting point for me and 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 not not using the, the work that you allude to but I guess going back to the discussions of the of feminist techno science the, the Donna Haraway's work in the 1980s and Judith Butler's lectures on on ethics in the tradition of Spinoza and ethics to really kind of take as the starting point this notion that you know, what is the I and, you know, how do we come to know ourselves? And I think that links also to one of the questions in the, in the side panel here around, you know, what is it about the humans in the loop that I find so, so problematic? And I guess that this is back to this point that you raise, which is really the notion of, well, what sort of a human and what kind of an agent are we talking about in this, this, uh, this representation of the human in the loop? So I'm trying to get at something else, you know, just as Haraway does in her, you know, 1988 essay where she's talking about the partial and thinking about all knowledge as partial, as embodied and as situated. And, you know, if we start from there and we don't start from the notion of an opaque and unknowable thing where we stand outside of that thing, then this actually brings us to a different place. I think even in relation to some of the claims about objectivity for example you know that for, for Haraway you know the claim about the the uh, about the observer and about the objective observer itself needs to be rethought as you know what would a partial objectivity look like what would a situated objectivity look like and I think that these are questions that you know as Nick in his work on on ethnographies and algorithms really highlight that we they're questions we can actually ask you know in our research in kind of specific contexts what what does objectivity mean in this um, situated and embodied making of the model or what actually is meant by bias here what, what does it mean to adjust a particular uh, weighting of a layer in a neural network what kind of assumptions about the world uh, are represented in that adjustment and so you know, while I can't speak directly to, to um, the work that I have not used, I suppose, in, in, in my book, I think I have tried to reinvigorate what I see as a neglected tradition. I, I think that, that actually Catherine Hales and Donna Haraway and others as 
feminist theor theorists of techno science and technology have been somewhat neglected in the kinds of discussions that we have about um, algorithms and power and perhaps particularly in, in my own discipline of, of human geography. So thank you, thanks for your question. Nick? Yeah, I mean, one thing I would just add to sort of pick up on this, this is a question from, from Mary Gray about the human in the loop, uh, is that work by people like Mary uh, on the variety of people who are involved in algorithmic systems, right? So not just the designers and engineers and maintainers or the people that I've done field work with, but people who are doing content moderation work, all data, you know, cleaning and training. Uh, there are, I think from my point of view, the, the point of the human in the loop uh, is that there are humans in the loop, uh, but what it means to be human is sort of an open question and what they're, what they can do, what they're permitted to do. Uh, is an open question. There's a, a recent mm -hmm. uh, co edited volume um, called, what is it called now? Uh, Life by Algorithms. It used to be called Robo Processes, but it's a bunch of al anthropologists writing about sort of algorithmic uh, stuff in different, in different settings. And a lot of it's not actually algorithms, literally, but the point through it is very much uh, uh, saying that bureaucracies of various sorts uh, can have these kinds of, of, of uh, machinic qualities that really constrain people's agency. Um, but the point, sorry, the point though for me of the human in the loop uh, and why I think it's it's interesting uh, is that the way that software is built now to sort of empirically uh, involves all of these tight feedback cycles with so many human actors, right? They have all sorts of ideas that they're using to make sense of, of, of the, what comes in front of them. So if you're developing a, a recommender system, you're going to put in your favorite artist and see if the stuff that comes out makes any sense. And as a result of her time, it's going to make always sort of work for your favorite artist because you're just going to sniff test that as you go. Uh, if you're someone doing content moderation for Facebook, you've been trained by Facebook, but you're also learning what makes sense to you. And all these people's judgments they're in all you know it's not a loop but there's lots of loops and so i think that for me is the reason why a kind of ethics that calls for a human in the loop uh doesn't really mm -hmm. work because there are humans already in a bunch of loops mm -hmm. and the problem isn't so much having a human there or not um but thinking about the sort of ethical imaginaries there and i want to point to there's a recent article by sarita amrute about the people involved in different positions and they're sort of and she sort of puts forward a, a uh, uh, an ethic of care argument uh, for thinking about what is the work that all of these people do to sort of attune themselves uh, and with the system and with each other within these sort of distributed systems. Yes, yeah, that's a really great point. I mean, the um, the surgeons that I describe in the book, so in the chapter on, on, on machine learning, looking at surgical robotics, this was so striking to me that actually the, the, the surgical the decisions made by surgeons were also changing in relation to how they were seeing themselves and their relations to others not only to their patients and to the mri images of their patients but also this kind of sense that folded into the neural networks of those surgical robotics were the very many past gestures and judgments of other past surgeons who they would never have met you know so this sense of a kind of i think in the in that chapter i try to think it through as a kind of we you know what sort of collective is it and how can we how can we think about the yeah i guess the human and the non-human elements of those things and for me there's a practical political implication there as well because if we were to try to you know request some things so if we were to say well actually we want all of those images to be deleted from that facial recognition database you know that that we, if we were to kind of make that claim and say that's what we wanted and if the images were to be deleted but the match scores were to remain for example you know i would want the kind of liveliness of that match score and its capacity to do something else in the world which will have a, a kind of which will be actualized potentially in a form of police violence against a future body in a future city so even even at the very moment that the match score is no longer perhaps identifiable as something in our in our conventional thinking about data and data subjects any longer that we, we might still want to think about that as as an attribute and as something which has a kind of ethico political consequence um, and, and is, is important so so i guess that's also part of my wariness about the human in the loop is also the invocation of a set of already decided or accepted notions of rights um, and I guess notions of morality you know to come back to kind of Spinoza's distinction between morality and ethics in which the human in the loop would be adjudicating using a particular set of codes if you like 
um, what should and should not happen. Should this image be deleted? Yes, no. And, you know, and if that is complete, once that act is complete, does that deal with the responsibility fully? And I want to see a, you know, in the book, I call it a kind of crowded court, like an extended and expanded sense of where we might think about those openings and points where a responsibility could, could reside. Yeah. When did you realize that this, this was a book about ethics? Uh, <laughs> I, I have a question written down that just yeah. says, when did you become a philosopher of ethics? <gasps> As a provocation because uh, mm. it's not in your previous work. And in some ways um, it's quite an intimidating yeah. endeavor, you know, because uh, it, it is qu quite often seen to be the realm of ph philosophers. I, yeah. I was very happy that there was no Rawlsian and veil of ig ignorance that uh, we, we came across, <laughs> although there was the trolley cart, which, you know, it was part of the case study uh, indeed. But what, yeah. what, what was it? Uh, was it always intended to be this or did, did it, you know, press itself mm. upon you uh, in, in the writing? Yeah, that's such a good question. I think, um, it was not intended to be the central focus. And I think that what happened, particularly through the field work, so the, you know, when I look back over the kind of interview transcripts and the field work and sort of talking to um, the designers of particular algorithms, but also those in particular public and private organizations responsible for using those kind of systems and talking to them about what they do with the output and how they refine the model and so on, that one of the kind of the, the kind of key themes that arose again and again was this notion of and in the book I think I describe it in, in one of the chapters as part of the, the field work this notion of well we don't need to know it exactly we just know what good looks like we know what good looks like and this came back again and again in the material we know what good looks like we you know in a totally different context we understand what a protest is and is not and our algorithm can show your um, your home office uh, authorities or your immigration authorities exactly what an immigration infraction is or is not. So this notion of a good and a bad that comes through also I think in what in the book I call a kind of coded or encoded ethics which is about well could we have better training for data scientists or computer scientists or could we have a kind of um, you know as is proposed by one theorist a Hippocratic oath for computer sciences or for kind of algorithms, um, that this made me more and more concerned, this notion that, that the central terrain was becoming about identifying the kind of the good and the bad, or the good and the evil in relation to algorithms. And that for me, the starting point was actually, these are already ethico-political beings. So this, in a sense, that was my starting point, that already they are, I describe it in the book, as an arrangement of propositions. You know, and as an arrangement of propositions that's always malleable and very fungible in terms of how the shifting of a particular parameter will instantiate a particular output in particular individuals or groups in different ways. That, that to begin with ethical politics and not to see this as something that was sought from the outside. Yeah, it came quite quickly, you know, but it came from situated fieldwork. Um, and I guess also from my background in international relations in which, you know, these discussions about, well, actually, how, what does it mean to think about war, violence, conflict, to think about uh, state action, somebody in the, in the, um, in the Q&A here is talking about the state of exception, you know, what does it really mean to, to have a state of exception? So these, ha these have been questions central to my work for a long time, but you're right, ethics was ethics was not the initial um, direction. And I guess I just kept telling myself there's another way of doing this. There's, there's another way to address ethics that is not about let's have ethics for AI. What would better ethics for AI look like? And so I guess, you know, one of my colleagues asked me recently, you know, what, what makes you, what drives you on when you're writing, you know, because you have those moments, like Nick was saying with his book, where you feel like it's never going to get there. And I suppose it did become also a spur to the writing to try to find this different way to write about ethics, one which I felt was actually already a part of the traditions of social science and humanity. So where we're very often locked out from the discussions of um, of computer science and, and mathematics, in fact, actually in physics, that this is for us a terrain that is something we're trained in. You know, it is a part of what we 
what we think about and what we look at. So, yeah, so it, it, it felt like both familiar terrain and something novel in, in terms of having to kind of think through very carefully, what is it about the call for a more just artificial intelligence, which on the surface should look like something we all want. You know, so I was kind of asking myself, why was my response to this a feeling of real concern that this was not, you know, this is not going to be adequate to the task, that to extract the bias, to feel that somehow you'd excised some of the more damaging components of a particular model, that this would deal with the problem, you know. And I think when you have a, you know, a background in political science as well, this idea of, well, the idea that you deal with the problem, the solution to the problem, you know, is inherently then for me a depoliticizing move. So already the kind of attempt to deal with AI ethics as a code of practice, for example, was something which I, I was profoundly worried about in terms of what might happen to, to politics, right? To, to our capacity mm -hmm. to, to bring a political claim in the world, which was my kind of, throughout the writing of the book, that's the thing that kept me going, you know? So to sort of really think through what might the consequences be for us to be able to signal that another sort of future is possible in, in the context of technologies that are reducing the possible futures to a single output. Yeah. This might be a good segue to consider a question. Uh, th there's one on facial mm. recognition technologies yeah. uh, that raises the question of whether or not uh, banning uh, it, in particular cases is necessary mm. Um, or does it obscure the concerns you're highlighting? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to say something about, about that? I'd love to. Yes, thank you, Sanjay, for that, that question. Um, I, I'm concerned about this, uh, the banning. It, oddly, it might seem very strange, but my, my feeling is that it has actually been quite straightforward for the tech companies to distance themselves from facial recognition and to say actually we're not doing this now and in, in particular we're not we're not selling it to police forces uh, and, and borders authorities and my feeling is that if one treats as research material for the humanities and social sciences the computer science journals so if you know i keep on my desk a pile of the most recently published computer science uh, articles then I would think we would say even five years ago, the notion that this was ever about the face has already begun to erode from the discussion in the computer science. And it's become instead about feature spaces, much more broadly defined feature spaces in which the face is just one possible uh, vector that could be extract extracted from an image. So my feeling is that this has already moved on in the practice of computer science and in the deployments actually of these technologies across multiple spheres of kind of government activities from policing to immigration control to pandemic management that means that it is now possible for them to say this is no longer facial recognition and strictly speaking that might be right because now it might be about saying like in the final chapter of the book where i look at scene understanding you know i think that is what is wanted not just is the face of this person the same face as the person we saw in this protest six months ago? But how are they carrying that, that bag? How are they walking? Who are they with? What does, their, what does their data show on their visa application that they made six months ago? Has their, does their travel pattern show that they've infringed that? I think that's the cloud politics, right? That, so the facial recognition is, a, is one component of that. But my concern is that by banning it, we take our eye off the ball, um, which, is that, which is that this is not a technology primarily about recognizing faces. It's about the capacity to detect patterns in data and in particular to, to, to look at features so that all, in effect, all space becomes a kind of feature space from which you can extract these kinds of um, signals. So. So calling for a ban is again, as we're back to this question of, um, of rights and my concern about an appeal to already existing bodies of rights that seem to attach to you know, rights bearing individuals that they are insufficient, always were, and now in these circumstances are specifically kind of emerging as insufficient in relation to what's actually happening, I think. Yeah, I'd like to know what other people think of that actually. The facial recognition problem. 
Well, so maybe a, a follow up on that. I think there's a question here about like you're saying the aperture, right? Like what sort of mm -hmm. view on the world do we have and the and the facial recognition sort of abolition call is definitely interested in sort of carving out part of this, right? And saying like, mm -hmm. this shall not be part of the sensorium of computers. Um, and as you're saying, there's obviously always other things. And one of the defining qualities of these systems is that they're omnivorous and they're just gonna grab data from, from sort of everywhere and pull it together. Uh, uh, as they can. But I wonder if another mm -hmm. question here about the aperture uh, would, would involve how they're used, right? Like where the um, uh, uh, sort of what the settings are. Because we had this news story in the US at least last month about, you know, the first person who was falsely arrested on the basis of facial recognition mm -hmm. uh, uh, software. Uh, and that happens, of course, not because an algorithm like shoots at a hand from the computer and grabs someone and, and arrests them, but because it sort of coordinates with a, a juridical apparatus. And I think it was David Columbia was pointing this out on, on Twitter when it was happening, yeah. that uh, what was really happening here was the state of that as a, the status of that as a kind of evidence had been raised in the pro, in the process, right? If this kind of thing shouldn't be uh, considered evidence uh, at the level that it was. Uh, and so to make sense of it, you have to make mm -hmm. sense of it, not just as an algorithm question, but as a sort of policing and juridical apparatus question. And so that, I guess my one question I would have for a cloud ethics then is, it, it feels like one thing we're doing is broadening the frame. Uh, do we yeah. need to broaden it even more, right? Is, is saying it's a cloud thing actually narrowing too much? Is it carving off something like the fact that a police uh, mm -hmm. department is going to do what they want uh, and use an algorithmic system to justify it post hoc? Mm -hmm. um, you know, can, can we yeah. expand it and include that here? Yeah, that, okay. I mean, I guess I also then have a question for you then, because, <laughs> because if, we, if, if algorithms, I think you so convinced, convincingly argue that we should be, instead of seeing algorithms in culture, that we see algorithms as culture. And that means that algorithms are not just in the culture of policing and the politics right. of immigration control and borders and, you know, who gets a loan and, and who gets a job and so on, but they actually are redefining what that whole thing could constitute for us. So that you see what I'm saying. So that then that means that actually, yes, the policing question is a policing question, but it's it's being entirely reframed through the kind of question of of the algorithm. And I actually found it really interesting that the when the um, news reports in the U.S. around the first person was the first person arrested. Did you say was that how? It was? I, I, I think it was something yeah, like that. Yeah. So I'd been I'd been looking at. Um, the uh, the young woman, I think she was at, at uh, Brown University, Amara Majid, who was falsely uh, identified by a facial recognition algorithm following the Sri Lankan bombings. And very quickly, the Sri Lankan authorities issued an apology in which they said the, uh, the algorithm had made an error, right? This is back to this kind of, the focus of the chapter on madness of, you know, sheltering the output of the algorithm in an error and saying look this was an error because actually you know she had as a, as a younger woman she had written um publicly uh, criticizing the trump's trump regime and looking at the the treatment in particular of young muslim women in the context of the the trump regime and so you know my feeling is that if we if we're willing to extend our understanding of the algorithm to think about it as also involving these kind of dividing and political practices that you might actually conclude she was not wrongly identified at all, right? you know, as a series of kind of um, uh, coming to the attention of the authorities, a series of risk algorithms in which the attention to the facial recognition is just one element of a much broader set of practices that are really uh, not about is this person the same person we have here, but actually worse than that, what is their propensity to be posing a problem to the state? But actually on those measures, you might say that this problem of recognition and misrecognition is entirely redefined. So, so I think I want, you know, and that's, that's work that I'm trying to do at the moment is kind of to sort of think back about, well, what would it mean to misrecognize and are not all claims to recognition also forms of misrecognition? So yes, and I, I, we've gone off the track now of, the, <laughs> of, your, I mean, of my strand of thought, yeah. No, you're pointing at the way that these propensity, like framing these as propensities, it's sort of impossible for an algorithm to be wrong, right? It's a way yeah. of couching predictions and it not, and it's not in, only in a technical sense, like, oh, hey, it was 60% and it didn't happen. So that's the 40%, um, but also in a sense of like, you know, uh, that becomes data obviously going, going forward and this error is intrinsic to the, to the working of these, of these systems such that they can't yeah. really be meaningfully called errors any, anymore.
Um, it's easier for someone like me to say that in the context of like, oh, I got a bad recommendation on Spotify. And I can say, well, what's a bad recommendation anyway? Um, in that case, it seems like fairly uh, uh, you know, low stakes. But obviously, the stakes mm -hmm. are enormous and, and quite different in other contexts. So one thing we might also poke at as we're sort of nearing the end of our hour uh, is variety, right? So we, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned in the book that you're really interested in the technical specificities of these things. But yeah. we have been sort of talking about the cloud. Uh, yeah. as one kind of, of apparatus. And it might yeah. be important then for us to sort of look and say, well, maybe it's not actually, you know, we got a lot of, a lot of yeah. uh, headway in a decade ago from saying, oh, these algorithms, it's everywhere. Um, but it might be useful to say, well, maybe that one's not the same as this one. I think that's right. And I think then I have a, um, you know, another question that I'd like to ask you too, which is, you know, in terms of music recommendation algorithms, is whether you've encountered uh, the, the people working on those things actually treating the different domains in which they're operating as you know really not 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 being all that significant so I think in the book that I I write about one um, uh, uh, it's a it's a tech company working on gate recognition but they'd also worked on casino fraud and then they were moving into counterterrorism and policing they'd looked at online gambling and their their, their point was that well actually the way that our deep neural networks work you know, we can we can swiftly move from one domain to the next. And they said, well, I know, and actually, we we can have these pre-populated data models in which, if we're asked to work on a domain where we feel we have inadequate data, we can just train the sort of final layers of the of the deep neural network for this domain specific problem that we can use the already existing convolutional neural network or recurrent neural network or whatever it is as our kind of basis and i think that's actually so interesting yeah. then because then the notion that these are harmless things in areas like music or video recommendation but harmful in the drone program and so on that's exactly what i want to try to say we shouldn't be doing you know and actually the work that i'm doing for a new project that I have where I'm looking at um, organ transplantation algorithms is to say, you know, this may look like a huge opportunity to save lives using uh, machine learning to identify the kinds of organs that can or cannot be used. But actually, the fraughtness of the kind of politics of that decision are still significant. And the way that those convolutional neural networks have learned to recognize a healthy from a unhealthy kidney has a direct link to the way that the drone program identifies civilian and non-civilian vehicles. I mean, if you go back to the kind of computer science journals and how object recognition evolves from the work of people like Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun and others, you know, these were, were projects designed in the context, again, of feature spaces, almost indifferent to how the, what, what those spaces are when they're situated. So I'd like to know what you think about, about that in terms of music recommendation. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I get a lot of pushback. Uh, you know, I review uh, peer reviews on my book proposal saying, oh, why isn't this about like a more serious uh, uh, area? And I want to, you know, whatever. There's a lot of answers to that. Um, one of which is uh, because this is only one book. But I think that uh, one of the things you're pointing to is the sort of role of domain independence as something uh, that's highly valued in computer science and in, and in data science, mm -hmm. machine learning, et cetera. Uh, there's an article that's in, I think it's in Social Studies of Science, uh, David Rebus and a few co-authors about yeah. the logic of domains where they talk about this, right? The way that computer science and data science in particular sort of renders the world into topical domains that can get sort of brought in uh, into computer science, which is the, you know, this thing that gets to stay outside. It's very cybernetic-y and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that one thing you're work is pointing us towards and this conversation is pointing us towards uh, is a lot of work to be done in trade and not just saying okay we refuse domain independence everything's sort of particular um, but in sort of tracing where things are and are not mm -hmm. domain independent because what I saw a lot of is that in the academic side you'd have people say okay here's a metric that you can use for like any of these kinds of systems and in practice you talk to someone who works at a music streaming company and they say yeah I mean no we can't use things off the shelf from anywhere everything we do is so hyper tuned to our platform mm -hmm. not just being music but like the fact that people who use our service happen to use it in this way right it's evolved to shape yeah. right on into that that we can't just like pick that up and scoot it somewhere else so the way that domain specificity and domain independence mm -hmm. sort of come and go um it's complicated and i'm not quite sure i can wrap my head around entirely like when it does matter when something that happens mm -hmm. over here happen matters over there and also it might matter mm -hmm. historically right my if my fieldwork is five years old um things have changed a lot mm -hmm. in the last five years i think on precisely this point mm -hmm. 
Thanks. Yeah, that's really interesting. It would be good to hear, um, because I think you, you introduced uh, that in relation to the idea of the cloud, uh, Nick, and the kind of specificity of the cloud. And I definitely, I felt like in the opening mm -hmm. chapters, when you're following the work of Wilson and the cloud chamber, uh, mm -hmm. I could see you're very excited about like this moment and, and how uh, productive it is, it is for, for your own, for your own thinking. But I, I wondered the, the degree to which the analogy of this moment, uh, you know, really mm -hmm. structures some parts of, of the discussion in, in ways that um, pose challenges for that question mm -hmm. of specificity. Uh, you know, like yeah. wh whether or not the notion of the cloud in some mm -hmm. ways embodies that challenge of the, the ambiguity or, the, you know, the, the, the lack of clarity or the lack of specificity all the while, while you're trying to give it specificity mm -hmm. at the same time. Because uh, I, I felt that tension in there, and I wondered, you know, if that mm. if, if Wilson was partly responsible for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Wilson or, or Peter Gallison's treatment of Wilson, I uh -huh. suppose, you know, in which what he's doing there is kind of insisting on the the distinction he's drawing between kind of mimetic and analytic scientific instruments, which is what what Gallison's getting at in his discussion, also of Wilson's cloud chamber. Yeah, I think I was quite excited writing that. And it was about, it was about thinking about, well, what does it mean to, for a scientific instrument to become the thing through which an emergent phenomena is detected and one that is not actually designed through hypothesis. So I was trying to shift my thinking beyond, you know, uh, inductive forms of logic and beyond notions of kind of hypothesis uh, formulation in relation to data mining that I looked at in the past in the last book and th think instead about well what do these kind of generative practices mean and how do we how do we think about them but actually that for me there were also um, productive connections between his his determination Wilson's determination to classify the kind of genera and species, if you like, of clouds. So he was borrowing from the kind of natural sciences to kind of think through um, a, a form of cloud classification and how this might how this might work. And I'd been reading kind of Spinozan ethics in which he very specifically says the formation of notions of of, of genera and species is, is, a, is, a, is a kind of ethical question. That is the way that we divide and apportion up the world is itself an ethical question. So, so, so there was a connection for me, like a kind of productive connection between the, um, that drive to try to classify. And then he was confounded by um, the cloud chamber itself. But yes, you're right. I mean, you know, asking my physics colleagues to show me how the Clyde Chamber worked and watching them argue about what the best way to uh, use this kind of radioactive thorium would be and was, was productive for me in terms of thinking about, well, actually, what are we talking about here when we're talking about a kind of apparatus um, that's working in this way? So, so that, but then to come back to the cloud, because I have asked myself this question many times, you know, it's, is it just an analytic is it just an analytic, you know, in terms of what the thing that's kind of made me want to look at this in more detail over the past six years or so. And I have to say in the last few months in the UK where GovCloud, you know, gov.cloud is now all over everything in the UK, right? So, so data is no longer in particular departments. So immigration data, health data, education data, this is all in the government cloud. So what I wrote in that chapter about um, in the first chapter of the book where I talk about the, the provision by Amazon Web Services of effectively not just cloud storage, but cloud applications. So I was saying not just analytically, but actually politically, this is a really important move. This means 17 intelligence agencies are sharing data and sharing modes of analysis. Now things, as Nick said, have moved on and things have moved on to the point that we're now talking about um, Amazon Web Services, so same provider of cloud an analysis and cloud storage, being work used across the UK government in every area so that it is now possible to combine the analysis of your data on uh, health records with, you know, in the context of the pandemic, this is like a gloves off kind of situation. So I will still insist that there's a political importance and significance to the cloud because of what it makes possible 
and because of the things that now become more difficult. So if we say, is something shared and are we, are we lawfully permitted to share this data? I'm noticing real slippage here because now they're saying, well, strictly speaking, we don't share it. It's just available to that entity because it's already on their platform. It's already in their cloud, right? So now we don't really share. So again, it's back to that language of an encoded ethics of privacy, data protection, and so on. These are undercut by the technologies of the cloud. So I will, you know, I will still insist on the kind of important politics of the cloud and what it makes possible. Um, yeah, Thank I'm you. still worried all these years on, I'm still worried. <laughs> We, we have, we're, we are out of time, but I would like to just offer Nick the opportunity to ask a, a, a final question. Uh, if not, I, I have one myself. So, uh, well, I will give you the final question then, because you're our host. And I was okay, taking Okay, and I must apologize to the many good questions that are sitting in the, in the Q&A. Uh, but this is uh, my prerogative as a is, <laughs> facilitator. Nate, I was thinking before, is there a way we could preserve the Q&A and then I could post the, some responses through some, your Centre for Digital Inquiry? We could that, post responses. That sounds yeah. excellent. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there is a way. Of yeah, we'll find a way. There'll yeah. be a way. Yeah, okay. So, so last, uh, last question. I mean, it's, it's partly, it's, it's just a little bit more than an observation, but one of the things that I was really um, de delighted about in, in this book um, was in some ways the return um, of deconstruction. I felt like you were enthusiastically carrying uh, <laughs> of grammatology along with you. Yeah. Uh, it, but uh, it, what I really enjoyed uh, in, in, the, in the chapter on um, the author uh, in particular was, uh, was, I mean, not just a celebration of deconstruction, uh, but, um, you know, a really considered um, drawing from that tradition. Um, and here I'm using it very broadly and um, really you're drawing more on Foucault, uh, I think, when you're discussing authors and, and a number of other people, of course. But one of the things that I think is, is really important, and as you, you mentioned before, is this um, willingness to kind of carve out some terrain um, where, where people in the humanities and social sciences um, can lay claim to their expertise. And whether it's ethics um, or, an, or an ethics that really pays attention to questions of um, you know, the, the proposition mm -hmm. or, uh, or the statement or uh, you know, however you want to frame it, um, I thought you did a really excellent job of bringing in insights from from areas that, uh, you know, up until recently, mm. I'd only ever heard, you know, this discussion framed in terms of people from the social sciences, you bring your mm. questions and people with the data will bring the answers. Mm. And, and everybody in the humanities and social sciences says that's not good enough. But I don't think we've come far enough to, to really like unpack what, you know, what we can bring um, and, and too often get caught up in this version of ethics that, that is unsatisfactory as you, you know, really, um, you know, display. But then this kind of uh, enthusiasm and confidence for, for taking up these traditions and making them work um, in, I think, really quite nuanced ways, right? Like big discussion of, of uh, Foucauldian ethics, but it's not care of the self you know, extended mm. to this new topic, it's, um, it ha has innovation. So, uh, you know, it's not a question so much as a thank yeah. you. Um, and, 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 you know, if you have any suggestions about what other people may uh, be doing here, we still have 70 odd people listening in about how they can use their training. Uh, yes, or, thank you. I mean, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I use it confidently. I, I actually think that part of what I want everyone to do, and I'm always telling my PhD students this, is just do it even if you're not feeling confident about it. You know, like follow your curiosity. If, if you're, so my feeling with the, the chapter on authorship, you know, I began actually with the memoirs of the novelist John Fowles. So I began with a novelist. I didn't begin with um, going back over the, the books that I've had for 25 years or so or whatever on, on deconstruction. I began with a novelist who was, memoirs were reflecting of his years of writing novels that actually coincided with when Derrida uh, first published uh, Grammatology. 
and actually John Fowles comments on that. So he comments on the way that he feels deconstruction does speak to his experience of writing. And I found that fascinating that he's, his memoirs were a kind of reflection, a kind of embodied reflection on not knowing when he's writing where it is going and being sort of half conscious of the pathways, the bifurcated paths that he does, that he's not taken and that the that the whole thing will look different if the novel will look different if he doesn't follow that pathway. And I found that just completely compelling because of the sort of resonance, if you like, with these, these kind of fieldwork experiences I'd had of people saying, well, we feel our way towards a solution. Actually, that's a Turing expression, you know, that the mathematician mm -hmm. feels their way towards a solution. But, you know, I think that this ought to be territory that we feel comfortable in being, or even uncomfortable, but just that we work with it to try to find those kind of productive resonances between writing in science and in literature. And I think, you know, Foucault does make it, I think, in his work on authorship, quite clear that, you know, at particular historical moments, this does apply to both literature and to science and that we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't constrain our sense of what the author function does and perhaps specifically the relationship between the author function and the source, you know, so that this for mm -hmm. me in terms of thinking about, well, why are people seeking an ethical um, location in source code, that this is actually also very productive for me to think through, well, actually, how does an author work with their sources? And, and how much, you know, what Deleuzean kind of fabulation is involved in those sources. So I'm not drawing an analogy, really, between the authorship of novels and, and the authorship of of code at all. No, that's absolutely not what I'm doing. I'm trying to prise open questions about what it means to, um, to write that it's something which is always iterative and which is always open to the, re the reader and is always open to other future writing, which seemed to me to somehow capture something about the, the language of iteration, which if you pick up a computer science journal, it's full of ideas like iteration and similarity and context right so the language is there and it's used differently and i find those clashing vocabularies really productive um so i i guess if i was speaking to a humanities audience i'm saying don't let them tell you that you are outside of this thing that's happening you know I, part of my background is also in, in in modern languages and i think that many of these problems are also those grappled with in translation and in you know when we read a novel in a second language how we respond to it so i think that there's so much that could be productive for thinking about how a society that now begins to know itself partly through machine learning algorithms will bring a critical lens to prizing open i think i you know use this notion of fabulation from deleuze a cracking open of the story you know, that's what humanity scholars do, crack open the story, think about the narrative, think about the, how those things are held together across their differences. So I want that to be something that we do and insist that it's part of a kind of broader set of societal discussions about, yes, about how we wish to live, you know, with these machine learning algorithms among us, if you like. Yeah, it's our terrain right. too. <laughs> Thanks, Louise. All right. I think we should call it uh, a day. So I just want to say thank you uh, to the participants for uh, following along with us today. We will uh, have this available uh, online at some point. Um, thank you, Louise. Thanks, Nick. Uh, I really enjoyed thank this. You. I hope uh, to see you all again soon, uh, maybe in the flesh, maybe not. Let's see. Can I, can I just thank everyone? I would like to thank you, Nate, for doing this. It's, you know, it's just great to ha still have things happening. But also I'd like to thank Nick profoundly and everyone who's attended because everybody is working you know, from home with children around or with elderly parents on the phone. Or, and I think it's just so important at you know, events like this that we acknowledge that people are doing that in very difficult circumstances and, and that, you know, that that's kind of part of our, what we foreground in these kinds of occasions rather than what we try to screen out by trying to find a room where we don't have children doing their homework. So thank you so much. It means a great deal to me that people managed it. Okay, thanks.